All right, everyone. I am here with Francisco Weber. Francisco is CEO and co-founder at Cortical.io. Francisco and I first caught up four years ago. He was my 10th interview, believe it or not. Francisco, we're over 400-something shows now, coming up on 450, I think. Uh, And man, it's been a long time, especially when you factor in 2020, which was another four years worth of... uh... By itself, yeah, absolutely. (laughs) How are you? Yeah, fine, thanks. So uh, much better than the situation, sort of. So I I am one of the lucky ones. So uh, hello, and thanks for having me Uh, once again. I'm uh, super excited to be here again. Uh, was a uh, as I'm told from friends who listened uh, to the to our first uh, co-production, um, they said it's uh, quite le- legendary by now. So <laughs> nice. Uh, looking forward um, for today. Yeah, I think it remains one of our most popular shows. Certainly in the the year that it came out or the year after, yeah, it was a very popular show, mm-hmm. um, and. I certainly learned a ton and I expect to learn a ton now before we get too far in. Uh, it's been a while. Uh, it'd be great to have you, you know, share a little bit about your background. We can refer mm-hmm. folks uh, to the older mm-hmm. interview in the show notes, but, you know, maybe let's start with uh, an overview of your background. Yeah. So um, I'm actually coming from natural sciences. So uh, I studied medicine in Vienna uh, but uh, I was lucky enough to be born in an era where uh, it was a thrill to become a, a computer nerd uh, of the very early days. And so uh, I got very interested in this. And um, while working a lot in research at the time, which cannot be compared to anything that the a lab's doing today, uh, but uh, we had these first... Um, trial and error phases of gathering data digitally um, and then uh, doing the statistics and some database and stuff like that. And uh, I try to basically stick around that focus point where uh, the data meets uh, the silicon, basically. Um, And in 2000, uh, I uh, decided that I've done uh, enough research in sort of the natural sciences and I wanted to go more uh, professionally into um, computer programming. I started my uh, first company um, as, a, as an open source uh, sort of uh, service provider, uh, which was quite successful at the time. That was, uh, you know, the times when the, the, the Sun systems and Microsoft systems, which were occupying all of uh, business uh, computing, uh, started to see some Linuxes and stuff like that come up. And that was... Uh, pretty uh, interesting time. Uh, And then from there, I grew into um, information retrieval, as it was called in the pre-AI era, uh, which basically is um, uh, finding textual information in some large um, collection as quick and easy and precise as possible. uh, then I started uh, my um, next company together with uh, Daniel, who is also the founder of uh, Codical.io. Um, and uh, we basically grew a specific use case of the previous company into a new company, which was all about patent search um, and patent analytics uh, and these kind of things. Um, and it, as it turned out, that's sort of the one of the most challenging er areas uh, to be in when you do NLP, what we did at the time. At the time, there was no AI. We had to craft our (laughs) stuff uh, generically. Um, But what was a very good experience for me is to see two things which seem to be very opposed. One is uh, astonishingly much that can be done by using computers on text. Uh, but also um, astonishingly hard are certain things uh, that seem so easy uh, for us humans. Yeah? And that looked to me very strange as a situation. Um, and my feeling was that um, the way how we are trying to do this by fundamentally using statistics, basically, um, will not lead beyond a certain level. Yeah, uh, and and I think uh, yes, of course, language uh, 
has some statistical pro properties. So that's uh, correct. And that's the reason why applying to words makes some sense at some point. Uh, and it actually improved. I mean, uh, just uh, remember what Google was in 2002. Yeah, I mean, if you compare this, to, <laughs> and I'm not so, I'm not talking about the company. I'm talking about uh, sort of the search, the, engine. The, the, the search engine, the technology yeah. that's actually applied. Yeah. Um, yeah. So uh, we started Cortical IO in uh, 2012 when I had some sort of uh, loose plan on how things could be done differently. Um, and luckily, uh, by being in Austria and Austria having a pretty good uh, early business funding uh, and research-based uh, funding scheme where you can uh, apply for, I would like to build a prototype for this. And if you can convince the guys there that there is a realistic <laughs> chance, uh, they give you actually money. Yeah? And yeah, uh, yeah. that was... Uh, that was the birth uh, of, of Cortical.io, basically, to get uh, uh, some money that would allow us to have a, a, a bunch of uh, uh, data scientists and software engineers uh, to build the first prototype uh, of our approach, which is a, uh, of course, biological approach, uh, uh, given the context of my uh, own background. Well, let's, um, maybe, let's maybe dig into that a little bit deeper yeah. because I think that is one of the reasons why that you know earlier episode resonated so strongly with folks uh, yeah. at the time. Yeah. And uh, as I understand it to this day, Cortical mm -hmm. solved, you know, you're you're looking to solve problems that many other people are are looking to solve, NLP uh, in the NLP domain in particular. But the approach that you're taking is one that is very different from the generally pursued uh, yeah. approaches. Um, you know, let, let's maybe kind of refresh on you know that biological inspiration, the approach, what that what that really means, and how mm -hmm. it's different. Yeah, so uh, my big inspiration uh, for, for, in, for sort of uh, coming up with something like semantic folding, which is sort of a theory that um, explains the representation of uh, words, basically, in, fundamentally, but also all other kind of text. Um, I got that inspiration from, from Jeff Hawkins, uh, who um, is, um, I think, well known, uh, especially in the US as a, a founder of uh, palm computing and so on. And he uh, basically uh, became neuroscientist uh, in his uh, second uh, career, if you want. Um, and he came up with something really fascinating, namely a, a formal explanation on the information science part, from my point of view, uh, I mean, he does this very biologically, so he sticks uh, super close to what uh, 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 neuroscientists figure out about the brain. But the, the the very relevant step that he does is he integrates this back uh, into a consistent uh, sort of, I, I don't want to call it model because it has nothing to do with uh, models that we know nowadays, but as a mm -hmm. model in the sense of a conceptual model. Yeah. Um, and in fact, that helped me to um, actually find what the problem is. And the problem and uh, the beginning of Cortical I.O. was uh, very closely tied to this is that fundamentally you need to do the first step, which is to find an appropriate representation. Uh, and that is what uh, semantic folding is about. It's uh, um, basically not trying to use uh, statistics um, and to... Uh, break uh, any piece of language down in uh, sort of billions of uh, uh, variables and hyperparameters that are uh, sort of tied together in an un understandable way, uh, but to rather try and reconstruct from an information science perspective what our brains would have to do, given the fact that I know that they are built in that and that manner. Yeah, mm -hmm. That is... That is the, 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 the point there. And uh, what we found out actually is um, the brain is sort of a real organ. So it has to process on some real data. Um, the only data that actually uh, comes into the brain 
um, as language uh, is sort of acquired. So it has by some ways, so by some means, uh, to 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 come in from outside, um, and. Uh, the, 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 the basically the way how how does the word cat actually look in my brain that's fundamentally sort of the the problem that I saw there and the approach we had so far is that we said okay we don't even want to know how this looks like but let's assume it has uh, 25,000 parameters whatever function that representation uh, is uh, let's have some brute force combinatoric work on this until it fits best. Yeah, um, which is uh, amazing on one end. Yeah, that you can basically parametrize stuff in the world and you can get uh, a representation of highly complex stuff like uh, five million uh, eShop eShoppers. Yeah, you can sort of find out what what they look like, how they behave. Uh, without going into the detail and without studying uh, psychology and, and whatever. <laughs> <laughs> On the other hand, um, the problem is that this is a real brute force approach. Yeah, So uh, you, you have to fill enormous matrices. You have to perform a lot of uh, 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 computation. Um, and so we start now to see that uh, there might be an issue with this. Uh, so the way how we do this is basically um, that we drop the concept, concept of a uh, sort of a floating point uh, representation. Uh, that's the first thing to do because there are definitely no floating points uh, anywhere close uh, to neurons. Uh, because uh, they can barely switch on and off. Yeah, so <laughs> if you want to do them, have them do uh, uh, floating points uh, that won't work. So uh, in the end, um, uh, from today's perspective, I would say uh, we replace um, statistics um, and floating points uh, with uh, basically set theory um, and uh, geometry. Yeah, so. Uh, very uh, basic sort of, um, uh, in terms of calculus, very basic uh, uh, mathematical uh, uh, ways of doing this. Um, so what we basically do is that um, we try to find a representation for textual content. So we call these representation fingerprints. Uh, and they are like bitmaps, basically. Um, and uh, the interesting thing, I mean, it sounds simple, but in the end, if you think it through, you will find out it's quite tricky. Um, if you have bitmaps, let's say 100 times 100 in, in square, uh, and you now uh, throw in, let's say, 200 uh, dots in this bitmap, the rest is uh, white, um, you should, what you need is a function that renders any given word in a bitmap such that words that are similar render into similar bitmaps. Yeah? Um, so as I said, this sounds uh, easy, but if, if you want to do this uh, for all words in a language, yeah, uh, it's pretty tricky. Um, and the other thing is that uh, based on what uh, Jeff, Jeff Hawkins found in his uh, sort of uh, uh, neuroscience-based uh, approach, uh, is that sparsity seems to be an extremely uh, important aspect. So uh, you have two things. You have a lot of neurons, and only a very small fraction of them uh, is active at any uh, given time. And that seems to be key, and this is completely opposite to the way how we do uh, deep learning, where we operate basically on, on dense data structures uh, only. Yeah? Yeah. Um, and, and, and so by bringing these aspects together, um, um, and by saying for um, rendering uh, the data properly, what you need to have is what I call semantic grounding. So uh, the variable that you have, the representational vector sort of that you have, uh, has to bind to something real. Yeah? And uh, again, um, in the statistical world, there's nothing is real. It's all only secondary information being derived from the real thing. Uh, but there is, in the end, at the very bottom, sort of of the of the uh, chain, there is nothing real attached to it. Uh, 
Uh, and that has a lot of consequences. Yeah, that, uh, for example, the, all these problems today we have with uh, bias in models and stuff like that is fundamentally tied to the fact that all of our models are, are only tied to the data that they have been generated of, but they are not tied to the actual reality that this data actually um, sort of represents itself. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So a lot of um, <laughs> sort of conceptual constraints in this. Um, and we have uh, developed a technology that allows you uh, to sort of simulate the way how uh, the brain acquires um, information through language. Um, we do this by listening, by reading uh, other people's um, uh, mentions. Uh, and uh, uh, technically, we implement this by uh, crafting a reference corpus. Yeah? So that's a collection of all the documents that contain all the stuff that we know our uh, new brain uh, to know about. Uh, and uh, this has, of course, one uh, advantage because reference information, to be more specific, is, for example, if I uh, want to build a system that understands uh, medical diagnosis, I don't train uh, the semantic folding engine on medical diagnosis uh, and millions of them because they have a, an enormous variability, of course, but I rather teach the system the language in which those diagnoses are uh, described, basically. So what I take are uh, medical textbooks uh, and stuff like that, uh, scientific papers on a specific domain, if, if, if need may be. Uh, and that material um, is uh, transformed um, into a conversion engine, basically. You can imagine this to be like a transformer. Uh, just that it works um, on two dimensions. So that's where the geometry comes in. Yeah? Mm -hmm. uh, so in that bitmap uh, representation, at the end, I can look at every position in my bitmap and I can refer it back explicitly to the bits of reference information that I trained it with. So behind every dot of my bitmap, there is a subset of the text of the reference uh, material. Um, and every word now is a pattern of all the pieces of reference material that contained my text. Yeah? So it's a distribution that happens, and that seems also to be uh, crucial in, 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 in real neuroscience, sort of. That's also the way how, how the brain seems to do this. Um, yeah, and there are an, a number of um, uh, very useful um, sort of mathematical properties to these uh, sparse distributed representations. Uh, namely, you can add them together uh, and uh, they still sort of, and they actually then become the meaning of what those two words added together uh, means. So, um, and uh, that's the way basically how you can um, create fingerprints in the end of any piece of text by just uh, aggregating the words of a piece of text, and then you get a fingerprint of that paragraph uh, or a whole document, and then you get the fingerprint for the document. Mm -hmm. um, quick, quick question for you: At the you know time we originally spoke, you know we were kind of well well down the path of you know word to vec and embeddings and that stuff yeah. being popularized mm -hmm. uh, even more so now. Um, but it was pre. Um, you know, kind of the revolution in pre-trained language models and, you know, transformers and GPT-3 and, and yeah. some of the things that have, uh, that continue to get a lot of attention nowadays. How does the approach that you're describing compare to, uh, you know, are we talking about solving the same kinds of problems as a language model? Do we have the same properties that allow it to be pre-trained? Um, yeah, yeah, you get yeah. this question a lot. <laughs> yeah, so <coughs> um, yes, uh, we uh, basically you can look at semantic folding like a, a language model. Um, and uh, initially, we were of course uh, working hard to get our language model to sort of behave in a way similar to other long language models, because otherwise we would not connect to anyone. Um, and we were very much focused on 
creating certain functionalities, uh, but mainly, of course, like everybody in the uh, early days uh, of high volume machine learning, we were focused on precision. Yeah, that was sort of the the, the golden carrot uh, in front of us. Um, but uh, uh, at some point, we had sort of a, a pivot in the company in the sense that uh, in the beginning, we were trying to solve more or less like a service company specific problems that others have. And we were focused on that. And uh, uh, so we had one project after the other. Um, and uh, we realized after some, uh, some time or after a number of projects that whenever uh, we become uh, sort of uh, successful in competing, let's say, with other um, approaches uh, in the business uh, area, uh, we were always the first ones uh, to be ready. So when there was a, a certain amount of time uh, for a POC, for example, uh, we were the first ones to have something to show uh, um, to the customer and so on. And in the beginning, I did not pay so much attention. I just said, okay, we seem to be uh, more efficient or whatever. I don't know. Mm -hmm. uh, but then I found out the big difference is, um, and I have to say, I might also not have understood it uh, completely at the time because I was, of course, very much focused on our own technology and only just very superficially in these first years being able to follow what all the others were doing. Yeah? So as I was working in a, in a very different way, uh, it was not natural for me to read uh, papers about deep learning because those were not my problems I had to solve and stuff like that. And only over time, I, I started to also um, um, sort of uh, fully... Um, um, grasp sort of the extent of, of deep learning, for example, or transformer models and, and, and all of this. Um, so over time, what I realized is that uh, in principle, our strength uh, is uh, not so much to be measured uh, as precision, uh, because in the real world, you have things like uh, humans doing annotations with barely 60% precision. Yes, yeah? so, okay. <laughs> And, and when I have a customer uh, who sort of asks me, and, and, and your system is 99% uh, uh, precise, and I say, okay, if you create a 99% uh, precise uh, training uh, material plus evaluation framework, that's fine with me. <laughs> uh, um, no, so we found out that it's in fact uh, the efficiency that's uh, that's the, the 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 business factor that uh, uh, is actually helping. And as time went by, and uh, I realized that um, uh, basically the statistical modeling uh, generated uh, improvement also very much by just throwing more uh, uh, computing power at the problem. Uh, and uh, so I, I saw sort of a, a problem grow there. Yeah? Um, and uh, so we, when we did our uh, pivot, as I said, away from uh, being more service-oriented, even I would say a little bit researchy company, you know, yeah. uh, looking for thrilling projects uh, with customers and stuff, um, we switched over and we said, no, we, in order to properly scale, we should uh, become a product company and we should uh, sort of package some of our functionalities in a way um, that we can literally sell them. So that's how we started. Um, in the end, uh, the goal became more ambitious because we said, okay, look, we need so much less data because having semantically grounded representations um, a handful of examples typically is enough for the system to pick up the characteristics, yeah? Because there is not only 0.01% of the data that contains semantic payload, 20% uh, 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 is the payload that we have here. Um, and uh, in fact, as, as we saw many, many times in, in practice, when we were in a, in a more competitive uh, situation, we basically uh, grow models of let's say, same quality uh, like all the others uh, by using uh, uh, 1,000 times or 10,000 times less uh, training data. Um, and uh, we have been sort of refining this. And uh, in the end, we came up uh, with the first product 
that is used in uh, contract analytics. So it's, it's, it's contract intelligence, sort of the topic, uh, and also the name uh, of the product, uh, which is about uh, uh, reading and understanding uh, business contracts um, and extracting information uh, in a structured way. So um, every contract, I mean, sorry? Before we jump into the contract yeah. piece, what was the that factor in terms of the amount of data, uh, the data efficiency of this approach? Um, yeah, so for example, our um, um, standard uh, English uh, language model uh, is trained with something like uh, maybe 100 gigabytes or so of text. Um, that gives it a strength as if you would throw BERT at it with uh, the Google corpus. Uh, um, so the other thing is, of course, uh, a small corpus like that uh, is computed in two hours or three hours on a, on a laptop. Yeah. So that's the other thing. Uh, by the way, I didn't uh, mention our fingerprints um, are actually a Boolean. So when we, when we train, as I said, we are not using uh, floating points at that level and so on. Uh, and that whole approach of uh, pre-processing the data in a way that the semantics of the domain is basically in the geometry of the topology of the fingerprint. Yeah? So that's why I made the, uh, uh, the, the statement before when I said we are using uh, set theory. Uh, so a certain piece of reference text is part of my collection or it's not. Uh, if it's part of my collection, somewhere in my fingerprint is a corresponding dot for it. Yeah? So there is a, a very clear direct link uh, from the root data um, to the actual representation. And the position that dot has versus all the other dots, so the, the topology of that uh, space, yeah. Uh, the geometry, if you want, of that uh, uh, patterns that you get, that contains the knowledge of the world which I'm using the language of. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and so that uh, basically, and that is super easy to compute for um, uh, for for a computer. I don't even uh, need a GPU for that precisely. Yeah. Uh, again, kind of in, in recent months gpt3 has gotten a ton of uh, attention it sounds mm -hmm. like you're able to do similar things uh, do you compare them directly and, and kind of compare their performance or are you saying uh, that like what you're doing is you know equally performant but much more efficient or are there is a the trade-off space more nuanced um well i mean the it, i think it cannot be directly compared because in principle uh, GPT-3 by itself is not doing anything. Yeah, It's just you type something in and you get something out. Yeah, mm -hmm. uh, But that's not a business system that uh, sort of uh, is supposed to do something specific. I mean, uh, we have all seen uh, a whole bunch of uh, really impressive tricks Yeah, where you type in, you say, what does uh, cat mean in French? And it tells right. you in French. Yeah, uh, But uh, if you say, what is coffee machine in French? You might get something wrong you don't know it yeah mm -hmm. so it's it, that, and that's not the kind of technology that you can use as such um in in a business environment yeah um but you can define but, some you can define some kind of benchmark based on you know this representative of the type of some class of problems and compare directly the performance against a, a benchmark if, if you happen to have enough material to train it that that's the problem yeah mm -hmm. uh, and i think uh, if you uh, need to create a system that knows about uh, automotive and in, uh, industry in czech uh, i'm pretty sure that doesn't there there is uh, that data set doesn't exist yeah so there is no data out there of that size uh, about using the czech language for uh, describing the automotive uh, um, industry mm -hmm. and so that that's a a problem, so to say, um, because in order to provide um, a solution, uh, I need to have to create something uh, concrete. Um, and uh, with GPT-3, we are using the advantage that we use English. Uh, it's the most uh, sort of common language, most of the material by now. 
at least uh, modern material, I would suppose, uh, is English and so on. Uh, the other thing is nobody is exactly sure what GPT-3 has in its belly. <laughs> so um, uh, you cannot check uh, sort of billion page crawls uh, on, on the internet. And, mm -hmm. uh, I, I don't even want to know what, <laughs> what it all crawled for <laughs> learning what it learned. Yeah? Mm -hmm. So um, again, I think it's a very powerful demonstration of what you can do with, with statistics in terms of language, uh, but it doesn't actually get us anywhere closer to getting the problem fixed that uh, a customer wants to filter out um, uh, complaints uh, of uh, his customers out of emails. Uh, yeah, and he wants to do this in uh, 10 languages because it's an international company. Yeah? Mm -hmm. That's not something you're going to solve uh, at least somewhere uh, near uh, with GPT-3. Yeah? Yeah. Uh, and the point is, uh, and I have even not even not started to speak about efficiency, yeah? because uh, if one training cycle um, GPT-3 model costs, I don't know, I've heard lots of numbers, but let's say $5 million, yeah? Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, you have crafted models, I have crafted models, you know how often you need to sort of uh, chew them and, and, yeah. and recalculate them. Uh, come on, who's going to pay... Uh, Five, uh, five million every every round, yeah, uh, and that is already assuming the data is there to do this. Um, so I think for um, practical reasons, it's just not uh, fully usable. I mean, there will be at some point there will be business cases where what GPT three is able to do can be helpful. But look, if I make an allegory. Uh, it's a bit uh, going with a, a, a sailing ship, you know. It can be a big sailing ship, but in the end, you have to go where the wind goes. Yeah, it's not you who says. Uh, and what we are building is a motorboat. Yeah, so that you say, I want to go there, and you steer there, and you steer there at the speed that you want, that you or you can afford. And that is, I think, the the crucial point uh, for applying AI to business in the same way as we have um, applied uh, Microsoft Word to writing uh, text in the business. Yeah, so this yeah. at some point this has to become the normal thing. Yeah. Um, uh, I mean, I grew up in a time when uh, every uh, phone had a cable attached to it. Yeah, so. You see just the distance that we make as we as we progress, um, and, and and that's basically the reason why I think um, uh, efficiency is in the end uh, the key, because let's be honest, any or most of nowadays algorithm are, in my opinion, theoretically able to do the job. The difference is, does it take uh, a week uh, or three hundred thousand years? And it's literally, yeah. I mean, there are problems if you try to solve them by brute force. Uh, we might, we we need still to build computers uh, in order to to compute this. Yeah, um, and that is the problem with uh, with uh, combinatorics. Uh, uh, if you sort of uh, if you work in a in a too um, sort of uh, loose or flat pattern, you end up with huge combinatorics and very quickly achieve. Uh, the level where, yeah, basically it, it's interesting doing certain things, but it definitely is not uh, um, sort of commercially viable. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and so that kind of brings us to this, this shift that you've made uh, in your business to go after uh, a specific application area. And it sounds like that is contract intelligence for lawyers and law firms. And yeah. uh, what's I mean, the specific problem there? Yeah, so uh, basically, um, yeah, so we, the decision was to uh, come up uh, with implemented use cases. Um, and the ambitious goal that we have um, is to make the system completely usable by the lawyer himself without needing any data scientists or AI expert or so uh, to do this to allow the to allow the, the the people to train their own models and to own them because a good model basically captures 
the skills uh, uh, of the person who teaches. Yeah. Uh, so in some degree, I mean, there is no uh, le legislation around this yet, uh, but that's sort of, I regard this as the intellectual property of, of the expert who took the time and the effort to actually train an AI to do something he should own. Uh, it's his child, yeah, or her child, of course. Mm -hmm. And so that was uh, basically our goal. But in order to do this, you have to be able and shield completely um, the complexity. And most importantly, uh, you, you can't ask them to annotate... Uh, 10,000 documents, of course. Yeah. So yeah. that has to be reasonable. That has to be uh, an amount that they used to work with anyway. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, one um, of the uh, um, USBs, if you want, from our uh, contract intelligence solution um, is precisely that with something like uh, 50 examples uh, that you annotate in credit agreements. Uh, the system, and we've done this, uh, then extracts you like uh, 60 different variables and items uh, out of uh, 150,000 contracts uh, in a matter of half an hour or so. Yeah. Wow. Uh, and is, is this is the presumption that you have your the the customer is taking advantage of some pre-training that you're doing, or? Are, is the idea that your system is so data efficient that you don't need pre-training? Or is there some degree of pre-training like baked in? Uh, the, the only sort of pre-training that we have is that we provide a language model. So a system that understands uh, uh, English legalese. Um, and that is basically, uh, that's as if you book a lawyer, yeah, who he doesn't know anything about your business or about your contract or anything. But he knows what the words mean, and then he starts at some point, starts reading your material, and then he can uh, bring in um, uh, value to the whole process. Uh, and that's the same thing. So the system reads a, a document, but the actual model is purely trained on whatever uh, the user um, indicates. So you he uh, you have to sort of uh, select, let's say, a termination clause. And you have to tell the system, this is a termination clause. And you do this for 20 documents, 20 contracts, let's say. And the, and the clause, of course, can always be formulated differently. It can be in a, on a different spot in the document um, and so on. Mm -hmm. But after like 20 examples, the system will get 8 out of 10 already correctly. So that if you continue annotating, you only need to annotate for these remaining 20%. And you can because at any time you can inspect uh, the data, you can precisely find out what kind of documents do I still have to add to cover that blind spot. Yeah, and then maybe at 30 documents uh, uh, or 40 documents, depending on complexity, you end up with a system that uh, in, in normally is uh, far more uh, exact uh, than a human could be. Not for one document, so in one document the human probably is always super exact. Uh, but for 100 documents, um, human users are just, uh, as I said, about 60% or something like that. Yeah, yeah so and... Part of that where you're yeah. able to, um, to kind of actively correct uh, data set deficiencies to address issues. Yeah. Can you kind of talk through how exactly that, that happens? Mm -hmm. uh, imagining it's related to the idea that you went over earlier where you've got this kind of this matrix and you're able to look at one point and see the data set that yeah, contributed yeah. to that point? Yeah, so uh, uh, by now, so in the beginning, we have uh, worked only using the fingerprints and the fingerprints, you have to think of them as uh, the semantic representation, yeah, but there there are many other aspects to language uh, like syntax and pragmatics and many of these things that are relevant. And so, Interestingly, you can cover a lot of ground with semantics. That's, I think, in the end, the reason why uh, our brain ended up being a semantic computer, because the meaning of things is, in the end, the most powerful way of understanding. Um, but, of course, in especially professional language, there are also other aspects. For example, uh, you have to know that a certain word is a product from that company. You have to know this. Yeah. Uh, so... 
there you have to make uh, also specific examples and teach the system very specifically um, what certain data is. But what we then have found out is by having that representation, we could still use on top of this uh, regular machine learning sort of yeah so we can uh, uh, convert uh, the piece of text so like you use word to vec for example for creating a word embedding mm -hmm. uh, you can create instead of a word embedding you can create a, a fingerprint in terms of data vector that you give it's basically the same yeah um, and what you find out is that suddenly even super old-fashioned i don't know uh, uh, support vector machines yeah uh, start to work efficiently. So you can, where before you need thousands of examples, suddenly you need dozens yeah, with the same algorithm by just having the representation of the data not being sort of randomly statistic, but by being explicit and being semantically grounded uh, in all. It, it's You can imagine this to be as if the features were have been would have been uh, handcrafted, yeah, just that they are not, yeah. But the kind of um, uh, uh, strength of the feature is is close to what a handcrafted feature is, um, and so nowadays we basically use a whole um, um, potpourri of uh, pretty traditional uh, machine learning routines. So we don't need to build those huge models. We build tiny models that we can build on the edge. Uh, because uh, we need so so little data um, to actually uh, create them, yeah. mm. and yeah, and the, the the whole thing is basically so we have created that product. We have in the meantime created uh, also a second product, uh, which is about uh, semantically filtering and routing messages. So mail, for example, or um, uh, instant messenger kind of uh, messages. Uh, let's assume uh, a, a large uh, consumer goods company. Um, they have, I don't know, uh, 5,000 products. Each of the products has a Facebook page for a community around the toothpaste and around dishwasher, dishwashing soap and so on. Um, and they have to monitor, of course, that they comply sort of, uh, yeah, they don't start cursing or whatever on the, on the Facebook page. So they have to monitor this. Um, and today they do this by having uh, lots and lots and lots of people. I mean, uh, I keep forgetting, but I think Facebook, for example, they use thousands of people to just monitor the content oh, yeah. uh, of, of the site. Yeah, yeah. Um, and that's what what we do um, with our second uh, product. Uh, it's technically speaking, it's a classifier uh, that uh, can classify incoming text uh, at very high speed. Um, uh, I, I will come to this uh, in, in a second. Uh, but again, uh, the thing is, you train this classifier with 300 examples. Yeah? You show it 300 examples of um, um, customer claims, let's say, or uh, technical questions, or this or that. You give it a couple of hundred examples, and the system is able to separate it uh, uh, even more. Uh, sort of in any language. Yeah? So it's not limited uh, to one language where we happen to have uh, a language model. This can be trained on basically any language. Yeah? And so uh, you, have you have you hard pivoted towards the, the applications themselves or do you still offer the toolkit for folks that want to you know build things from a lower level? Uh, of course. Uh, nowadays, uh, the toolkit is uh, much much more matured. Um, and we do have a number of, starting from university to startups to uh, highly specialized niche players in certain domains who are using it uh, sort of by themselves. So they don't use any of our services or so. They're just using the, uh, this uh, through something like a REST interface or whatever mm -hmm. uh, um, to, to do. And, and it's astonishing, I mean, what, what, what they do uh, with this. Uh, and but on the other hand, there is also a bigger strategy behind those individual products. So uh, the first product, uh, contract intelligence, is about uh, semantic extraction, which is used to sort of render structured information out of unstructured. Uh, the second one is a semantic classifier, 
And the third one, which is sort of uh, in preparation to be to be moved over from our old uh, tool bench that we use to uh, sell services over to become a product, which is the search server. So we have also created a, a semantic search system okay. that indexes fingerprints and allows you to find documents based on a fingerprint and not mm -hmm. uh, on a keyword. And if you put those three pieces together, uh, extraction, classification, and search, I would claim you can basically build any application, business application, let's say, um, out of that. Mm -hmm. uh, and so the, the grand idea behind it is to have a technical platform uh, like, you know, Microsoft Office, uh, all you need for getting rich, um, uh, to, to have like uh, one system, but system at the business level, not at the, at the sort of AI engine level. That, that's not supposed to be an AI engine. That's supposed to be a, a business engine like you have a, a database server uh, to store, I don't know, uh, your uh, employee files. Uh, you have a semantic server that you use uh, to keep track of the um, uh, PowerPoint presentations uh, on your server uh, and uh, give people a warning if they start to create the same presentation over and over again because they just can't find it. Yeah, yeah, Stuff yeah. Like that. <laughs> I think everyone can probably relate to that one. <laughs> yeah. You know, it never uh, ceases to amaze me. I, I like to tease when I talk to folks who are working in search, I like to tease about just how bad search still is. <laughs> like, yeah. it's such a hard problem. And yeah. Uh, so many places that have, you know, you would think that they have a lot riding on it. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's, and I'm thinking in particular like e-commerce and, and online sites and stuff yeah. like that. It's still really hard to find what you're looking for sometimes. Yeah, yeah no, I mean, uh, uh, currently people struggle a lot with, uh, I would say, the usability of the search. Yeah. Um, uh, uh, but fundamentally, the big problem that you have is that uh, if your data set is big enough, uh, you will probably have something like 20, 30, 40% of the data that you cannot reach. So there has been science out uh, on this uh, saying that if you have a sufficiently large uh, collection of, of, of text, basically, and you want to search it, uh, by using just uh, statistics, you know, the, the old uh, TF-IDF uh, uh, magic, mm -hmm. uh, you will only find uh, a subset um, of the data that's there. And there is no way of finding the rest. Yeah? Mm -hmm. So it's not the fault of the search engine manufacturers. <laughs> it's, it's sort of, we. I think we have reached um, the end of, of steam engines, sort of, yeah? We have to switch over uh, to auto motors. Uh, that's in search. I mean, yeah, yeah, uh, and and yeah. And the solution is precisely to switch over to a semantic approach, uh, because there the problem is easier because you can model the data with a fingerprint, and you can model the user with a fingerprint. So, like based on what the user commonly looks for. Um, you aggregate the fingerprints and you get some kind of a representation of what the user is interested in. Um, so when you enter a query, which is also converted into a fingerprint, uh, you will look for which are the documents that have the most overlap with my query fingerprint. Okay, so it's a straightforward approach. Uh, the first advantage is you have a generic order already. So you don't have to apply ranking and, you know, all this magic that needs to be done. Mm -hmm. And in the end, you can even re-rank in terms of overlap to the user fingerprint because um, a, an attorney might uh, have a different interest in a bunch of patent documents than uh, an engineer. Yeah. They are looking, they, they might even cast the same query, but they would expect something different uh, coming back. And that's, you can only do this by properly means semantically modeling uh, also the user. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, that's that's uh, the the platform approach uh, that we sort of pursue. We we try to roll the platform out while doing products. That's sort of the approach that we chose to have. Um, Easy approach. Uh, yeah, but on the other hand, it makes sure that you only create uh, relevant stuff. Yeah, I mean, yeah. 
just asked a bunch of engineer, engineers to solve a problem and you get the solution maybe, but you also get so much irrelevant stuff yeah. that, uh, yeah, you're irrelevant in a business sense, of course. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, uh, as if that wouldn't be enough, we have uh, even started yet another angle um, to this uh, because we have also started um, to work in the hardware uh, space. Oh, really? Uh, yeah, so we um, have been... Uh, so initially there was some research done and we at some point found out, okay, uh, FPGAs are actually the kind of hardware that we need for our stuff. It's a, it's a, a piece of hardware that they can... Uh, super flexibly uh, configure and I can make it work on bits uh, and I can work on so many bits in parallel as there are in the chip. Yeah, so this is basically uh, the hardware for our approach. And is this uh, is the idea to make uh, the FPGA into like a fingerprint chip for these? Exactly. So, so all the uh, remaining uh, consuming computations that we do, and I mean, the computations we do are sometimes consuming, as I found out, I have to say, uh, as we as we went, uh, because we are always hitting the bottleneck of the von Neumann machine. Every piece of data has to go through that data bus. Yeah? Um, uh, but in reality, if I do an overlap of two fingerprints, uh, all the bits can calculate their own overlap. Yeah? I don't need to have a central processor doing this. Um, and so the idea is basically um, to create uh, computing memory, if you want, to get rid of the processor uh, as a whole. And we have um, developed uh, two years ago a prototype which was based on our search engine. Uh, and uh, the speciality of the so the the search the reverse index you would say for a normal search engine. Was running on the on a on a um, Silings Alveo board, um, doing the doing the the same thing in hardware. Mm -hmm. um, and the nice thing is that we could reduce it uh, sort of mathematically to the problem: how fast can you get uh, can you read out uh, the memory uh, that's attached to the chip? Yeah? That's basically the only current uh, limit. Um, but the big gain actually that you get is you get a search engine that does not become slower when you have more documents. It's a search engine. You have to add, if you have more documents, you add more cards, uh, but you remain in this sort of, uh, three, uh, three clock cycle, uh, find, uh, mechanism. And that's of course, another kind of efficiency that you need, uh, in practice, uh, if you want to. To, to sort of uh, make large um, large implementations. Yeah. Awesome, awesome. Well, it sounds like you've made a ton of progress over the past uh, <laughs> yeah. <four> years now. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So <laughs> we haven't been lazy. <laughs> uh -huh. um, yeah, so um, currently we are um, sort of uh, um, getting forward. Uh, so, by the way, we have also partnered with with Xilinx uh, in the meantime. So okay. uh, that helped a lot because uh, they are sort of industry leaders and they're super well connected in uh, the whole barrier Bay Area and so on. So yeah. that uh, helped us, of course, uh, um, getting well known and uh, also have to say, you know, for a small company, uh, even in that case, a small foreign company, uh, you have also to sort of uh, get people believe in you. And so if, uh -huh. if they see that you have more and more uh, big friends, then they, <laughs> yeah. they, they, they rather tend to believe. Um, yeah. I had an interesting conversation. This, this was years ago. A uh, longtime listener of the show, we were talking about uh, at one of our first events, uh, an AI summit that uh, he attended. We we're just talking about all the different things that he like heard on the show and okay. went and tried out. And one of the things was the cortical uh, oh. product. And I think he built a. He did this proof of concept at his company where they do this. Uh, 
they do an employee survey and they wanted to try to find the interesting bits of this employee survey and kind of do sentiment. And they used to spend, you know, weeks collecting this data and then pouring over it to, you know, come up with anecdotes. And I think he built some kind of sentiment analysis thing or some kind of tool using uh, using the the cortical toolkit. Uh, was, the public API, yeah. Okay, cool. Yeah, yeah, he was impressed with how quick it was to get something up and running. Yeah, that's that's the whole point. That's what you need. You need something that allows you to make a, a, a quick uh, experiment, see if that's applicable to a certain uh, problem. Um, and if you see it's applicable, you have just to redo the same thing with all the data, with all the, you know, but, yeah. uh, uh, and 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 you can get uh, within a couple of days. Uh, you can get things uh, up and going. That's and that's where sort of uh, the focus uh, right now uh, lies. Basically, is uh, working in things like uh, the, the the workflows that are needed for people to properly work with this, um, and 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 also to automate all of the. Uh, data pre-processing that might uh, come along. I mean, you you would not believe. I mean, we have been really doing uh, a hardcore machine learning for years, and then we end up with uh, scratching our heads on some PDF data and how to properly <laughs> read it out. Yeah, yeah. because uh, that's what you need. Well, to the solve. real world is messy, and that's yeah, yeah, yeah. That's yeah. hard. <laughs> yeah, absolutely, um, and uh, yeah. Are there any, uh, you know, resources, you know, new or otherwise for, you know, folks that want to dig into this kind of fingerprinting and semantic fo semantic folding? I almost uh, don't want you to say because part of, you know, I've always had this theory that uh, your first episode was so popular because people would listen to it two, three, four times <laughs> to try to really wrap their heads around some of uh, uh, what it means. Uh, so I shouldn't uh, ask you for resources so that folks can do the same thing here. No, uh, but I uh, will. <laughs> yeah, so we are we are um, currently uh, recrafting our uh, public access because uh, one of the biggest problems uh, we had is that uh, we we are still tiny, so we are uh, um, 32 people uh, still, um, mm -hmm. all, uh, scattered um, over uh, two continents. <laughs> um, uh, so that the problem was that uh, we had a hard time uh, keeping up uh, the demo resources with what actually uh, the, the state of the art we had actually internally available. Uh, so recently we have uh, switched gears for now uh, so that when people approach us and they say they would like to try out this or that, uh, we try to enable them individually um, mm -hmm. to do this. But I have this uh, plan uh, for 21 now to uh, make a new uh, state-of-the-art uh, publicly accessible uh, gateway available. And then it will be, of course, much richer uh, with uh, uh, many of the functionalities uh, that we have uh, added uh, in the meantime. Cool. Uh, other than that, I mean, just uh, uh, try me, uh, drop me an email or so. Uh, I always, uh, especially, and I mean, people come up really with cool stuff, you can't imagine, uh, that they work on. And so it's so fascinating. I, I, I love sort of uh, trying to uh, uh, not only sort of give them uh, the technology, but also to sort of brainstorm a little bit on how this could be, because you have to think slightly differently. If you if your word consists of fingerprints, it's a bit different than if it uh, consists of tensors. Right. So uh, you have to have a different kind of uh, look at things. Mm -hmm. uh, but as I said, I mean, the fact that we um, also use uh, traditional machine learning now uh, depending on the use case, of course, but we, we do on a, on a regular basis, but we use our own representation um, um, to train uh, a transformer model, for example. Um, yeah, that brings in completely new uh, uh, sort of perspectives um, into it. Awesome, awesome. Well, Francisco, it was wonderful catching up with you. Uh, it was overdue, probably, uh, but it's great to to get an update on you and the company and what you're up to. And uh, wish you, you know, continued best in 21. And let me know when the new docs come out. Uh, absolutely. So thanks a lot again for having me. It was a, a big pleasure.
Uh, and yeah, I will continue listening to your podcast. <laughs> awesome, awesome. Thank you. Okay. Bye.